Hello everyone, welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Today we're doing the Q&A video for idea number 16, which is gravity. I have to look it up. I always forget what number it is. Idea number 16 was gravity, which of course we use as an excuse to talk about general relativity, Einstein's wonderful theory of curved space-time and why that leads us to gravity. So for the Q&A video, we got a bunch of good questions, but there's also some things I wanted to fit in and didn't fit into the already enormously bloated and long gravity main video. So I'm going to divide it up in the beginning here of the Q&A video. I'm going to try to cover some bases of the actual questions, cleaning up some of the conceptual background for general relativity. And then we're going to skip ahead in some sense to talk about black holes in a little bit more detail. There's a whole bunch of things to say, obviously, about black holes. They're interesting. And so I wanted to use the Q&A video here as an excuse to do that. So for the actual questions, where do we start? Uh, let's start with the principle of equivalence which, of course, was one of the things we mentioned as an inspiration for uh, Einstein coming up with general relativity. And we talked about the principle of equivalence in terms of a small box. We said, if you have a small region of space-time, like a box, here you are in the box, and maybe you're on the Earth and you're being pulled down toward the Earth, or maybe you're just accelerating out in space, rocket ship, okay? Here you are, and you can't tell the difference inside the box in a small region of space-time. If the engine is quiet and the acceleration is uniform, you can't tell the difference. There's a lot of caveats there, right? And people, you know, have questions about these caveats. They're like, well, how small does the region of space-time have to be? Like, could I measure the gravity between the two forces? Are they self-gravitating? Uh, could I measure the difference in gravity from the top of the box to the bottom of the box? So the point is you shouldn't, I guess what I want to say is you shouldn't take this thought experiment too seriously, okay? Um, it's inspirational. It is not technical. The principle of equivalence is not a deep down feature of reality. What it was, was an idea that helped Einstein invent general relativity. General relativity is a deep down feature of reality, and you can show in the context of general relativity that something like the principle of equivalence is true. But they're not separately true. It was, it was something that was a building block. Uh, it's like a step ladder, you know, or a ladder you put on the top of the building. You put the ladder there, you climb to the top of the building. Once you're on the top, you can throw away the ladder. If that's where you want to be, is at the top of the building. So. When we say things like um, the principle of equivalence holds true in small regions of space-time, that's sort of supposed to push you in the direction of thinking that in the limit as the region of space-time becomes infinitesimally small, these statements become more and more accurate, okay? That's the idea. We talked about how that is sort of matching on to the idea in differential geometry that on a curved space-time manifold, the metric, the, the thing that describes the actual geometry of space-time, looks more and more like the geometry of flat space-time, the so-called Minkowski space-time metric. So that's the spirit in which you should be thinking about the principle of equivalence. It's not something that is, is supposed to be rigorously defined all on its own. It's more inspirational. Another thing like that, by the way, is Mach's principle, uh, sort of like that, but much worse. <laughs> Mach's principle, I, I, to be honest, have a difficulty even um, stating it coherently because it, it wasn't very coherent. But the idea behind Mach's principle is that I can I just write down the idea because I don't even know what picture to draw. But that inertial trajectories, which are special in relativity, they are well defined, are set somehow by matter in the universe. The idea being, look, we mentioned, whether it's uh, Newtonian physics or relativity, that there's no preferred location in space, right? The laws of physics are the same from place to place and from time to time. Uh, there's no preferred velocity. That's one of the things, if, if you forget about acceleration for the moment, this uh, thought experiment being in the box and not being able to tell what's going on uh, also applies to the question of at what velocity are you moving? This would have been just as true in Galileo's time. So it's, there's something called Galilean relativity. And of course, Einstein updates it for Lorentz invariance and things like that. But the basic idea is there is no preferred speed. There's no preferred velocity. There's no ether filling all of space with respect to which you can measure your velocity. By the way, off 
footnote here. Uh, very often we discover something in the universe, whether it's quantum fields or the classical electromagnetic field or dark energy or something like that. And people say, well, isn't that just like the ether? No, <laughs> none of those things are like the ether. None of those things define a rest frame. The whole point of the ether was to say, here's my velocity with respect to the ether. And then they went through long elaborate uh, reasons to show that you couldn't actually measure your velocity with respect to the ether. And then finally Einstein said, well, in that case, you don't need the ether at all. And he got rid of it. But something like quantum fields or the quantum vacuum or the energy density of the quantum vacuum, none of those things are things that you can measure your rest frame with respect to. There's no preferred velocity, so they're not really like the ether. Anyway, um, we mentioned way back when, when we talked about action and, and forces and things like that, it's interesting, provocative, I don't know what you want to say, curious, that there is no preferred place in the universe, no preferred location, no preferred velocity, but there is a preferred acceleration, right? There are some trajectories, some, let's say it this way, there are trajectories of constant acceleration, and some of them are different than others. They're all noticeable. You can tell in this box whether you are accelerated or not, okay? And you can certainly tell whether you are on an unaccelerated trajectory, which is an inertial trajectory. And so Mach's principle, Ernst Mach was a famous, very uh, bigwig uh, German physicist and philosopher at the time, and he, you know, he <laughs> was sort of charmingly wrong about a lot of things. He very famously didn't believe in the existence of atoms, so he uh, was sort of Boltzmann's nemesis, because Boltzmann was another famous German physicist at the time, Austrian, but moved to Germany. Um, and Boltzmann's whole career was built on the existence of atoms. And, and you know, Boltzmann could visit England, and they loved him because they were all about the atoms, because they had Maxwell and Thompson and Dalton and so forth there. But then he would go home to Germany, and no one would believe him anymore, and he felt very sad about that. Anyway, Mach's principle says the reason why... There are certain trajectories that are preferred as inertial, as zero acceleration, is because they are measured with respect to, their acceleration is measured with respect to matter scattered throughout the, all the universe. So somehow there is a dynamical, physical reason why certain trajectories were inertial, were special. And Einstein was very inspired by this, and this is something that Einstein really thought a lot about, and it helped him sort of perceive the idea of the metric as a dynamical field that has its own uh, equations of motion and the metric of space-time itself would respond to matter and energy. So there's no question, historically, that Mach's principle played a major role in the development of general relativity. The problem is Mach's principle is not true. <laughs> Once you have general relativity, it's just not true that inertial trajectories have anything to do. Well, anything to do is too strong. It's just not true that inertial trajectories are determined by matter in the universe. The most obvious example of this is that Minkowski space is a solution to Einstein's equations in general relativity. Empty space with no matter in it is a perfectly good solution to general relativity. And there are certainly inertial trajectories in Minkowski space. We can tell whether a trajectory in Minkowski space is being accelerated or not. Um, nevertheless, there's, there is, of course, in general relativity, the fact that matter scattered throughout the universe can affect trajectories in some way. It doesn't set what trajectories are inertial and what are not, but matter far away can, you know, push and pull things that eventually affects trajectories nearby. And for decades now, for a hundred years now, people have tried to make this feature of general relativity somehow map on to Mach's principle. But it just doesn't. It's just false. It was just a mistake. It was a, it was a good idea that didn't quite work out. One of the things I say is that for my uh, textbook, Space, Time, and Geometry, I was very proud. This was one of the first, maybe the only major textbook in general relativity to not even mention Mach's principle at all, okay? It's just, it's not any, it's not important anymore. Sorry about that. So trying to see how Mach's principle can be satisfied is not something that I would uh, put a lot of work into. Um, final note on, on this kind of thing is that um, these inertial trajectories in GR in general relativity, as we say, uh, inertial trajectories are geodesics. So inertial trajectories are still special in general relativity, just like they are in special relativity, but they have a slightly different character. So geodesics are, uh, that's not geodesics, geodesics. Um, geodesics are the 
extremal paths, right? The extremal length paths. So space-time diagram, space-time. Uh, maybe things are going on here. This is not necessarily Minkowski space. Maybe this is some curved space-time of some, of some sort. If you start here and end there and you have a path that connects them and you wanna say, is this an actual path that a free particle can take? Well, then you calculate the length of the path. In fact, if this path is time-like, you calculate the time along the path, and you extremize along all the possible paths what that time actually is. And I say extremize because in relativity, the physical paths will actually maximize the amount of time, the amount of clicks on an actual wristwatch that moves along that trajectory, thus the twin paradox, as we talked about. So there are still inertial trajectories in general relativity. Um, they just can be what might look like curved to someone standing outside. So uh, someone I think asked about, you know, the earth moving around the sun. This is a, I, I tried to under, uh, explain this in the original video, but, but, but it, uh, it is a little unfamiliar. So it's worth saying again, the earth orbiting the sun is doing its best to move on a straight line. Okay, it is the straightest possible line it can go on. And I know that's counterintuitive because it's clearly moving. Like, wouldn't a real straight line be straighter than this ellipse that the Earth does around the sun? And the answer is no, that would not be as straight a line in space-time. So when you draw that ellipse of the Earth moving around the sun, you're drawing a trajectory in space. You're ignoring space-time, and most of the Earth's motion is in time, not in space, because it's moving way slower than the speed of light, right? So the path that is actually followed by the Earth, which is pretty much a test particle for, for these purposes, is actually an extremal path, a geodesic in the curved space-time caused by the Sun. That's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing is people are asking about, um, since we were talking about the equivalence principle, what about the connection between inertial mass and gravitational mass? In Newtonian gravity, right, you have these two different things. You have inertial mass, which just shows up in Newtonian mechanics in the equation F equals ma, so call that the inertial mass. So the inertial mass is the constant of proportionality that relates the force acting on a body to how much it accelerates by, right? You might think that this is an intrinsic feature of the object, it's inertia, right? The amount of mass it has inertia-wise. But then there's also the gravitational mass, which is how much a body is, is affected by gravity, right? So the force due to gravity is uh, G, Newton's constant, M1, M2 over R squared, and these masses are the gravitational oomph of a body, right? In some sense, they're equivalent to the electric charge. They're the amount of, they're proportional to how much gravitational field the body creates and how much it's affected by. Um, the gravitational field. So conceptually, you could imagine these two things are different. You could imagine a world in which objects had a different gravitational charge than their inertial mass. And Newton said, hey, you know, in, in reality, these two things seem to be equal. That's why objects can fall at the same rate, right? Otherwise, objects would have different gravitational charges and they would not fall at the same rate. But he didn't know why, and so he said, you know, this is an interesting feature, right? Uh, so it's part of the principle of equivalence. The, the equality between inertial and gravitational masses is subsumed by the principle of equivalence. If inertial and gravitational masses were not the same, then you could, in fact, drop objects with different gravitational masses or different ratios of gravitational mass to inertial mass. You could drop them in the box and measure whether or not you were in a gravitational field. So the fact that the principle of equivalence is good implies that also in general relativity, inertial mass is equal to gravitational mass. But like I said, the principle of equivalence is not, you know, by itself, right? It's an inspiration for general relativity. The better way to say it is that once you have general relativity, it just follows that the inertial mass is proportional to the gravitational mass. And the reason why is because the source of gravity is the energy or the mass of things, right? E equals mc squared. So relativity-wise, these things are uh, interchangeable or at least comparable. Gravity is sourced by mass. 
the inertial mass, or whatever you want to call it. There's no separate thing. There's something called the mass, and that both affects the equations of motion for things and is the source of gravity. And that just falls out of how you derive Einstein's equations, for example, from the Einstein-Hilbert action, the Lagrangian that we talked about. So it's a consequence uh, of that. And so that's how it should work, right? Once you understand things better, you have a more comprehensive framework once you understand what general relativity is, then you can just show, oh yes, this thing that you might call the inertial mass and the gravitational mass in the Newtonian limit, they're gonna work out to be the same. Okay, um, good, so that was one set of questions. The other set of questions before we get into the black holes was dealt with singularities. And perfectly legitimate to be asking these questions. You know, I mentioned them very quickly and then sort of breezed on by them. Um, so in the context, for example, I drew a picture like this. Uh, remember the Kruskal diagram. Kruskal uh, is a mathematician who invented a certain set of coordinates that you can use in general relativity to describe black holes. And the nice thing about these coordinates is that even though space-time is curved, this is these are coordinates that make sense for a short shield black hole. So just a black hole with no nothing uh, inside or outside, just a, a black hole all by itself, a pure pristine black hole. You can modify them for more general circumstances, but that's where they're most useful. So a Kruskal coordinate black hole, black holes don't care about coordinates, but a black hole in Kruskal coordinates has the feature that the light cones are still at 45 degrees. So the light cones don't tilt over. Like one of the diagrams I drew, the black hole kind of looked like a cylinder with the event horizon going upward, um, and the light cones tilt over, so once you go in, you can't come back out. The Kruskal coordinates also um, convey what's going on inside the black hole, but they do so in a way, here is R, the radial distance away from the black hole. And they do so in such a way that at any point, the light cones look like this. That was a pretty shaky line. You're going to think that I'm getting old. I'm just trying to get be cautious. Uh, the light cones still look like 45 degrees everywhere. And that's a very helpful feature because you can sort of instantly see, just by looking at what's going on in the diagram, how you're moving. Are you moving forward in time? Are you moving space-like or whatever? And in the Kruskal diagram, the event horizon which itself is null, light moves along the event horizon, okay, is at this 45 degree angle. So this is the surface R equals 2GM. So I called that little r, that was a bad idea. I shouldn't have called that little r. Let's call it capital R because I'm not using regular short shield coordinates, I'm using Kruskal coordinates. And this is capital T up here. And then, so there's a relationship between Kruskal coordinates, capital R, capital T, or let's do it the other way around because you're used to seeing time first, right? So Kruskal coordinates, call it capital T, capital R, and then the short shield coordinates, which we're more used to, are little t, little r, okay? So, and then it turns out that the singularity looks like this. So this is r equals zero, the singularity inside the black hole, okay? Um, the one, and so here it is clear that there's, the time and space do not convert into each other when you are inside the event horizon. Some people still say that. Some grown-up physicists say that time and space turn into each other. That's crazy talk. What happens if you're, here you are, and you fall into the black hole, you go like that. You just move forward in time. But the time coordinates, the Schwarzschild coordinates, flip their nature. So that T, the Schwarzschild coordinate, becomes a space-like coordinate, and R, the Schwarzschild coordinate, becomes a time-like coordinate. But who cares? No one cares what the coordinates do. Time and space are still time and space, even inside the black hole event horizon. The point is that the singularity, the, the point of infinite curvature, is in your future. That's the true physical point. Um, so what I wanted to get to was the fact that there in some sense, both r equals zero and r equals two gm are singularities, but in a very, very different sense. So r equals two gm, which is where the event horizon is, is a coordinate singularity. I'll write the whole word out, there you go. Coordinate singularity. And what that means is simply, you have chosen bad coordinates. So certain coordinate uh, components, so let's put it this way. Remember when we wrote out the metric, you know, one minus two GM over R, et cetera? Certain components of the metric will blow up or go to zero 
in these coordinates. And when you have a coordinate singularity, you are very, uh, it's, it's perfectly okay to worry that something physical is going on, but it is not at all clear that anything important is going on at that point. You may just have chosen bad coordinates, right? This is something even Einstein really struggled with for years and years. Like, coordinates are not that big a deal. The, the, a lot of the development of general relativity the general relativity really sort of came to life in the 1960s. You know, Einstein and his friends worked on it for many years after he invented it, but uh, progress was slow, and a lot of it because there wasn't a lot of new data, right? You weren't discovering gravitational waves or quasars or anything like that. In the 60s, uh, we started really getting in data that, that pushed people to think about general relativity in a more careful way, and geniuses like Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking, you know, took up the challenge and did a great job at that. And so this idea that we could understand space-times without relying on coordinates was one of the important things to come out of that revolution in general relativity in the 1960s. So there's no nothing really bad about the event horizon. You wouldn't even notice, right? This is the thing you're always told. If you fall into the event horizon of a big black hole, there's no signpost there at the horizon. You would pass right through without even knowing. Whereas r equals zero is a, let's put the little arrows here, is a uh, curvature singularity by which we mean if you, I should not talk and write. There we go. By which we mean that you can calculate scalar quantities, okay? A scalar quantity means not a quantity that depends in any way on the coordinates, right? Just a function of space time. Uh, and you can calculate scalar quantities and they go to infinity. So there's a, at the curvature singularity. So there's a true sense in which the curvature is becoming infinite at the curvature singularity. Uh, but that sounds a little haphazard. I mean, some curvature scalars that you could calculate don't go to zero at the curvature singularity. So a whole, you know, subfield of general relativity arose in which what you do is figure out whether or not something really is a singularity, a true curvature singularity in some sense of the word. What is the once and for all set of criteria for whether or not as you approach something, some region or some point in the manifold and general relativity, you're really hitting a singularity. And the answer is, it's really complicated. <laughs> I, I, uh, I met this guy, Chris Clark, who is a professional general relativist who wrote a whole book called Singularities in General Relativity. And I was a young student at the time, and I said, well, that sounds interesting. Should I buy your book and read it? And he says, no, <laughs> it's not really worth it. Like, unless you really want to study nothing but singularities in general relativity, there's an enormous amount of technical apparatus that goes into kind of a tiny amount of payoff, relatively speaking, unless, like I said, singularities in general relativity are your thing. Okay. Um, and, you know, just to be clear, at the singularity r equals zero, uh, what happens, you know, if you, if you fall into there, you, this person falling in is going to die, right? You're spaghettified, you're torn apart, uh, you're spaghettified because the tidal forces due to gravity are stronger in some di directions. They, they pull you apart in one direction and squish you together in another direction, tidal forces. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going to be bad, but the actual point R equals zero, the, what we say is the following. You shouldn't include that point, r equals zero, in your definition of the space-time manifold. That point, or in this case, as you see, it's a space-like surface, right? It's not really a point. So singularity, even if its coordinates are r equals zero, that's not enough to say that it's a point in space. Here, very clearly, this particular singularity is a surface in space-time. It's a space-like surface. And so what you say is that you should just remove that from your definition of space-time. And if you're really honest, what you say is, we have no idea what happens there in the real world because the curvature there is so large, there's zero reason to believe that classical general relativity is accurate when you approach a space-time singularity. We know there's something called quantum mechanics. We know that classical general relativity does not include quantum mechanics. When the curvature is so large that it is, you know, the, the distance over which the curvature changes is smaller than the Planck length, then we think, believe, have every reason to believe that quantum mechanics becomes really, really important. So what classical general relativity has to say about singularities is irrelevant. Class is physically irrelevant, it might be intellectually interesting, but has nothing to do with what happens in the real world. So provisionally what we say is, if you hit a singularity in classical general relativity, you stop counting space-time, and that is really the end, space-time ends, but you also admit that in the real world something different could be going on. 
So in the real world, could you, you know, make a wormhole or pop out a baby universe inside a black hole? The only honest thing to say is we don't know, right? We don't have the theory of quantum gravity figured out well enough to answer questions like that right now. So until we do, we say space-time ends at the singularity. And exactly the same th thing is true in the Big Bang. Big Bang is a singularity in the past. Uh, T equals zero rather than R equals zero in the expanding universe metric. What can we say? You know, you can say, well, it's the edge of space-time according to classical general relativity, but then you should immediately say, and we all know that's not right, that's not the final story. So all we can say is we don't know what happens. There could be space-time earlier than the Big Bang, or maybe there's not. We just don't know. All right. Now, I was trying to draw this cruscal diagram carefully, but I'm going to have to redraw it again, because uh, the next thing I want to get to, I want to start talking about black holes a little bit more carefully. So um, there was a good question about time symmetry in black holes. After all, um, if you look at this picture, you fall into the black hole, and it looks like you fall in and you can't get out. In other words, you enter toward the future, and then something is true about you now that was not true about you in the past. But wasn't it true that all the laws of physics, including laws of general relativity, are invariant under time reversal? Like, how did that one-wayness come about? Why is it you can go in but can't go out toward the future? Like, if you ran the movie backward, you see someone being spit out from a black hole. So what's going on there? So that's a fascinating question, and one way of answering it is to take this... Remember, this, is, this, is, this picture is supposed to be... What I really should do, you know, what I, what I did secretly, I didn't tell you this uh, in the original video for gravity, but what I did was I drew this as a radial coordinate, so I started at capital R equals zero, right? So I drew this like as, as if you're drawing something in polar coordinates just in ordinary space-time, start at zero and get only positive values for the radial coordinate. But Einstein and Rosen, who actually uh, studied this, realized that and of course Kruskal studied it also, and others, realized that you could actually extend this space-time metric through r equals zero to negative values of r. There's nothing special that happened. Uh, there, the space does not go to zero volume, right? I mean, r equals 2 gm, little r equals 2 gm is, oops, try and draw here. This point at what looks like the origin of coordinates is that little r, the Schwarzschild coordinate, equals r, 2 gm. It's a sphere of area, you know, uh, <laughs> what is the area of a sphere? 4 pi r squared, okay, right? Um, it's not a point in space-time. And so you could ask, like, can I go through it? Can I go to the other side? And the answer turns out to be yes. So the full Kruskal diagram looks like this. It looks like what I almost drew up there. But basically, you can just extend what's going on in the universe to a whole new region. And so here is capital R, capital T. There is a singularity here, so there's no space-time here. That's excluded. But there's a whole other universe on the other side. There are people who could live here. And there's a singularity in the past over here. So this is the maximally extended Schwarzschild solution. And if I took a uh, slice through it, so let me, let me take a slice that just goes like this, okay? A space-like slice, and I ask, what is the geometry of that space-like slice? Well, out here, very far, uh, out here, right, far away, I'm far away from the black hole, it looks like empty space, so it just look, looks like flat space, so let me draw that. Here's flat space, okay? Um, but as I go in, it, become, it begins curling, curving, and then it curves, and as I go over here to this side, well, then I get far away from the black hole again, and it looks like another copy of empty space. And these two copies of empty space are connected by what we call a wormhole, or an Einstein-Rosen bridge, okay? So this, I really should, to be slightly more evocative, I should, oops, I should turn this on its side. What are the chances I can do this? Yeah, there we go. Not the best drawing, but you get the point. So this is that yellow line has the geometry that I represented in this picture over here. So the fully maximally extended 
Kruskal diagram, a Schwarzschild solution, describes not one but two copies of asymptotically flat spacetime connected by a wormhole and with a black hole in between if you do something uh, terrible. Notice you can't get from one side to the other. So if you try, here you are. So you're an astronaut in your rocket ship and you're going to try to get from this region to that region, but you notice that you can't go faster than the speed of light, so instead you will always hit the singularity and die. You can't actually cross this bridge, this Einstein-Rosen bridge. It's what we call a non-traversable wormhole, okay? But what you also notice, let me undo that because it's cluttering up the diagram. Um, what you also notice is that the whole diagram is symmetric with respect to time, right? There is something in the top half of the diagram and the mirror image in the bottom half of the diagram. So this is this region here. Actually, let's do it yet another color, okay? Green, perhaps. So this region here is what we would call the black hole. Whereas this region here, guess what? The white hole. The white hole is the time reverse of a black hole. And it has the feature that things can come out of the event horizon from the white hole to the outside world, but things can't go in because the event horizon is separating the, the singularity from the rest of the world in the opposite sense, okay? So a white hole is nothing more than a black hole played backward in time. And so, yes, it is true that the black hole violates time symmetry, violates time reversal symmetry. It's something that is in the future and not in the past. But that's also because a black hole is only part of the story. In the full maximally, symmetric, maximally extended Schwarzschild solution, you have both a black hole and a white hole, and the whole shebang is completely symmetric with respect to time. Now, having said that, we have no reason to think that white holes exist in the real world. Remember, this is a thought experiment where you take Einstein's equation with literally zero matter anywhere, and you ask, what is the solution that is spherically symmetric? And I extend it all over the world. But that's not what you actually expect. In the real world, you expect there to be matter. So if we do a slightly more realistic plot where we have something like, again, R and T, okay, but now we put matter in there. So now R, capital R equals zero, really is the center of everything, at least to start. So we put, you know, some stuff. This is a star. And then the star collapses, so what happens is the star shrinks to zero. This is the matter inside the star, and at some point an event horizon forms, and this is little r equals 2gm, and now you have a black hole inside here. Okay? This is a much more realistic space-time diagram for what it looks like when you make a black hole. So in the real world, you don't get this funky thing with a wormhole and a past white hole and anything like that. You have a star, it collapses, you make a black hole, and it's time asymmetric because your ending point is different than your beginning point. That's not surprising at all. Okay, so that was a very good question about time symmetry. Good, good catch there. But uh, these are all, we have to distinguish between in principle mathematical solutions to Einstein's equations, like this maximally symmetric thing with a maximally extended thing with the wormhole, etc., versus what is likely to happen in the real world where we have an arrow of time and cosmology and all those other things. Okay, but there's more I want to say about black holes. So let's dig in a little more to black holes and some of their features. Again, we could go on for hours. You could easily have a 24 uh, video course just about black holes, right? But we have to be superficial because time is of the essence. Um, so I'm just gonna mention some interesting facts. One fact is they have no hair, which is John Wheeler's colorful way of saying that black holes are characterized by their mass, their charge, and their spin. And that's it. I mean, a planet or a star also has mass. It also has electric charge. The electric charge could be zero probably is zero. If you have an astronomical body with a lot of electric charge, it just rips the opposite charge from the plasma around it and quickly neutralizes. That's just as true for black holes as it, was, as it would be for planets or stars. So in real astrophysical black holes, the charge is usually zero. Um, but yeah, like planets or stars, black holes can also spin. 
And we do expect that black holes do spin. In fact, what we've seen in the universe and the evidence we have for black holes and galaxies and binary star systems is that black holes tend to spin very, very fast. So spinning black holes are very, very astrophysically relevant. So you might say, what's the big deal? I mean, planets and stars have mass charge and spin. So do black holes. Why is this surprising? The, the point of cosmic, uh, sorry, this is not cosmic no hair. This is just black, black holes have no hair. All right, now I have to admit, there is a equivalent or at least analogous um, conjecture slash theorem in cosmology that the universe has no hair. If the universe has a non-zero vacuum energy, a cosmological constant, okay, then the universe sort of eventually approaches empty space with nothing but cosmological constant in it. So the universe has no hair either. That's called cosmic no hair. This is just black hole no hair. And the point here is that even though a star or a planet has mass, charge, and spin, they have other things as well. You take a picture of Jupiter or Venus or the Earth, they all look different, right? They have topography, they have lumps on them. There's oceans in some places and, planet and uh, continents in other places. Black holes don't have any of that stuff. The number of numbers that you would need to completely specify the Earth, what's going on on the Earth. I mean, the Earth has people on it and plants and a whole bunch of things. To completely specify the Earth we would require an enormous amount of information. Whereas when you have a black hole, to completely 100% specify it, you need to give me three numbers. It's mass, it's charge, and it's spin. That's an amazing fact. Um, and it's a theorem. I mean, you obviously, to, to prove these theorems, you have to make certain assumptions. Uh, that's what people do in general relativity. But this is part of the excitement in the 60s and 70s. People were proving theorems like this. So black holes have no hair. They're all very, very simple. Um, second thing, which actually has not quite been proven, although there's very good reason to think it's true, is cosmic censorship. Censorship. So this says that singularities are not naked, by which we mean singularities are hidden behind horizons. So we saw that in the picture, the pictures that we drew. So there's a singularity at r equals 2 gm. Here's a singularity right here and it is behind this black hole event horizon. Here's a white hole, there's a singularity again, but it is behind this horizon. And so you never get a space-time diagram according to the cosmic censorship conjecture, because we haven't completely proven it. We've proven it in certain special cases. Um, according to cosmic censorship, every singularity is separated from the wider world by an event horizon, is hidden behind an event horizon. Um, that's interesting. It's, it's important for various uh, features of general relativity, such as, you know, predictability, right? We said that once you hit a singularity, all bets are off, the theory is broken down, you don't know what happens next. So if you had a naked singularity, as it's called, just out there in the world that you could easily reach, poke at, and then walk away from, you wouldn't be able to use the equations of general relati of relativity to predict what was going to happen when that occurred. So to get general relativity to be predictable, you can hide all that mess behind an event horizon, and then you say, well, okay, I can predict what's going to go on outside the event horizon anyway. Uh, so that's the cosmic censorship conjecture. Finally, final fact, not final fact, but uh, last fact in this little three item list is the area theorem. I think this was Hawking who proved this. Um, the area theorem says that the area of an event horizon or collection of event horizons only increases over time. Now this is, uh, there's a clearly an arrow of time built in here also. So we're talking about event horizons in the future. We're putting an arrow of time in by not allowing for any white holes in our past. But the, the area of all the event horizons only increases with time. So this is the time derivative of the total area of all the event horizons goes up. Uh, so why is that a thing? So I mean, th this makes intuitive sense in the following sense. If you uh, have a single black hole, you can throw things into it, increase its mass, and its area goes up, right? The area of an ordinary Schwarzschild black hole is proportional to its mass squared because it's proportional to the radius squared, and the radius is proportional to the mass. The radius is 2 gm, um, Schwarzschild radius. 2 gm, 
for a short shield black hole, for a non-spinning black hole. So sure, if you have one black hole just sitting there, I can easily throw mass into it and the area goes up. And then yeah, that makes sense, the area goes up. I cannot throw negative mass into it. So one of the assumptions of a theorem like this is there are no negative mass particles in nature that I can throw into the black hole. Okay, but you might say, well, why do we say the area of the horizon rather than the mass of a black hole, right? I mean, by the same logic, I can only increase the mass of a black hole, not decrease it. It turns out that's not true. Uh, for fascinating reasons due to Roger Penrose. Remember, the cosmic no hair theorem says that there's mass, there's charge, but who cares? And there's also spin, okay? And when you have a spinning black hole, the area of the event horizon depends on both the mass and the spin. Basically, the spinning black hole becomes oblate, like a, like a flattened pancake. If it spins very, very fast, it's not a perfectly round sphere anymore. So this simple formula, area goes like mass squared, is no longer true for a spinning black hole. There's a more complicated formula. And it turns out that when you have a rapidly spinning black hole, you can decrease its mass by a little bit. You can, by something called the Penrose process, you can throw matter into the black hole uh, sorry, not into. Into is an exaggeration. You can throw matter very close to the black hole, have it split apart so that some of it escapes to the outside world and some of it falls in, such that the stuff that comes out has more energy than the original thing you threw in. So let's, let's, let me just, I need to show you a picture here. So the picture here, here's a top view of a spinning black hole. Okay, so here's the black hole. It's spinning. Let's imagine it has some spin in this direction. There's a region outside, but not very, very far outside. Looks like a smiley face. Um, called the ergosphere. Sphere. Top view. So this is the axis along which it's spinning is pointing at us. And what you can do is this. You can take some two objects glued together but maybe there's like some little latch or some spring or some explosive device that can separate them at the right moment. You can throw them in exactly the right way into the ergosphere, but not into the black hole. So don't let them cross the event horizon and then split them apart so that one of them falls into the black hole and the other one goes zipping out, okay? And Penrose showed that the energy here, E final compared to E initial, can be greater. That is what he showed. So basically, and what happens when you do that is the black hole slows down in its spinning. So basically you're extracting spin from the black hole and the total energy of the black hole also goes down at the same time, okay? So if you read, the, there's a massive textbook by um, Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler called Gravitation. And they describe an elaborate scenario where you know, a super intelligent civilization could power its energy needs from spinning black holes. And you know, according to the laws of physics, that is entirely allowed. It might be not very feasible, it may be dangerous, but it is allowed. There's a lot of energy locked up there that you can get out. So it is not true that the mass of a black hole can only go up, can't go down. But when you go through the formula for the area, the area of the black hole does always go up, even during the Penrose process. If you have two smaller black holes and combine them together to make one bigger one, the area of the big black hole is bigger than the sum of the two areas of the two smaller black holes. So the area theorem says the area always goes up. Now, look, you, you must be thinking when I draw something like this, when I write this equation, right, the area uh, only goes up over time, this does violate time reversal invariance, right? I mean, this does uh, require some kind of arrow of time, and I justified it by saying there's no white holes in the past, etc. But still, um, there's another famous equation that kind of looks like that, right? There's the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics that the entropy, total entropy of everything, only increases over time. I should say, uh, yeah, greater than or equal to zero, right? Now, those two equations are both very, very simple, but they do have a family resemblance to each other, right? And it turns out that the other laws of thermodynamics, uh, conservation of energy and you know, thermal equilibrium, things like that, all of those laws of thermodynamics have analogs in the laws of black holes, classical black holes, right? There's no nothing statistical here, like this area theorem is not like 
entropy or thermodynamics, where you have a bunch of little particles moving around and the collective behavior is what you're looking at. You're just doing classical general relativity and you get this as an exact result. So Hawking and uh, Brandon Carter uh, and others published the uh, laws of black hole mechanics. They had this elaborate analogy between black holes and thermodynamics. And then Jacob Bekenstein came along and said, well, maybe it's not just an analogy. Maybe black holes have entropy and maybe the entropy is proportional to the area of the event horizon and maybe there is a generalized second law, he only said this later, but that's okay, we're not going in historical order, that says that the sum of the area of the black holes plus the entropy of matter increases over time. The generalized second law of thermodynamics. Maybe they should just be combined together. Hawking was very annoyed by this. Uh, one of the reasons why he was annoyed is because he understood thermodynamics well enough to know that you can also think of entropy as relating energy and temperature in a certain way. And so if you really thought that a black hole had entropy and it really, you know, the area of the event horizon really was like the entropy, then just like a thermodynamic black body giving off radiation, black holes should give off radiation. And they're black. You can't say that black holes give off radiation. So he went and uh, tried to prove that black holes do not give off radiation, and he ended up proving that black holes do give off radiation. So what we got at the end of this uh, little drama was Bekenstein, see if I can spell Bekenstein's name correctly, Bekenstein Hawking Entropy, because it was really Bekenstein's idea uh, that black holes have entropy really, even though that Hawking and others had the formal um, analogy, and then Hawking really sealed the deal. And I'll, I'll explain how he did that. And there's a formula for it. Let me see if I'm gonna get the formula right. I'm not gonna get the formula right. Uh, well, I'll get it right, but I'll not fill in a lot of details. The entropy of a black hole is the area in Planck units. So you know the Planck length, which, which formula for which I do not remember. That's why I'm not going to get all the details right here. Um, you take the area in Planck units. So you have the Planck length squared is one Planck unit of area. And then you divide by four. That's all you got to do. And that is the entropy. The entropy, um, these are units where not only is h bar equals c equals one, but also Boltzmann's constant k is set equal to one. Boltzmann's constant converts entropies into natural numbers. Okay. So the area measured in Planck units, uh, or let me, let's put it this way. We can do it, uh, have, make it be a little bit prettier, okay? Um, the area of the black hole event horizon over four times the Planck length squared. There you go. That's all the details are there, um, except K is set equal to one, okay? And that is, according to Bekenstein and Hawking, that is the entropy of a black hole. And it's an enormous number. <laughs> if you plug in the numbers for realistic black holes, let's see what I got here. Uh, four times 10 to the 77 times the mass of the black hole divided by the mass of the sun squared. So a single black hole with the mass of the sun would have an entropy of four times 10 to the 77, which is a really big number. Uh, a black hole at the center of our galaxy with more than a million times the mass of the sun has a, an entropy over 10 to the 90th, which is more than the entropy of all of the photons and ordinary particles in the entire observable universe. So black holes have an enormous amount of entropy. And what Hawking also showed, and Bekenstein didn't quite go this far, is that black holes do give off radiation, and so they have a temperature. And this was Hawking's formula. I believe one of these, you know, he has a, uh, not a grave, but he has a memorial in Winchester Cathedral. And I think the entropy formula is on there, but maybe it's the temperature formula. Uh, the temperature, I did write this down. No one in their right mind would ever remember this, but H bar C cubed over eight pi G, which is Newton's constant, K, Boltzmann's constant, M, the mass of the black hole which for solar mass black hole works out to be really, really cold. <laughs> six times 10 to the minus six mass of the sun divided by the mass of the black hole, Kelvin, right? So Kelvin is the scale of absolute temperature where 
zero Kelvin is literal bottom of the temperature scale. So 10 to the minus six Kelvin is cold. Like the cosmic microwave background that suffuses all of interstellar space is about three Kelvin. This is six millionths of a Kelvin. Okay, so this is very, very cold for a one solar mass black hole. And as the mass goes up, the temperature goes down. So some people say, will we ever be able to observe Hawking radiation from a black hole? It's very possible the answer is no, because black holes that are astrophysically sized just have a very, very cold temperature. The background radiation of the universe completely swamps it by an enormous amount. Um, the only hope you would have is be able, being able to find a really tiny black hole, and we don't know how to make those, right? You know how to make a black hole from a star collapsing, but you don't know how to make a black hole that is like, you know, a few grams across. That would have a serious temperature, but we don't know how to get them. Maybe there's some left over from the early universe, from the Big Bang, but no one really knows. And then what this implies is that the black holes give off radiation, and they lose mass, right? And therefore, if the black hole's not spinning, its area will go down. Uh, and in fact, this, this whole thing happens in a finite time. So there's a lifetime for black holes. And the lifetime is, call it tau, I don't know, just made it up. Um, I'm not even giving you the equation for it, but for a solar mass black hole, 2 times 10 to the 67, okay, times the mass of the black hole in units of the mass of the sun cubed years. That's a very long time. The current age of the universe is something like 10 to the 10 years. 10 to the yeah, 10 to the 10 years, right? So uh, if you get a solar mass black hole, it will take two, it'll two times 10 to the 67 years to evaporate away, much, much longer than the current age of the universe. Because it's so cold, right? The temperature will increase as the black hole shrinks, but for the very long portion of the black hole's lifetime, it's just really, really cold, barely radiating at all. Uh, one way of thinking about this is that the typical wavelength of a photon being given off by the black hole is of order the short shield radius. So for a big astrophysical black hole, these photons being given off are very, very low energy per photon. Now you might worry, because I said there was something called an area theorem, said the area goes up. And down here I said, but wait, Hawking says that black holes give off radiation and the area goes down. What's going on? Well, the answer is the area theorem is not true. The area theorem is a feature of classical general relativity, and Hawking used quantum mechanics to derive the existence of his radiation. So what becomes true is the generalized second law. So this is true even when black holes evaporate. The area of the event horizon can shrink, but it's only by giving off a lot of photons that that happens, and those photons have entropy. So basically, the black holes are converting their entropy into the entropy of the gas around them. And then you can calculate, you can compare the entropy of the photons. I said gas, but I meant a gas of photons, if you're willing to believe in that. You can compare the entropy of the photons and other particles to the entropy of the black hole, and it is bigger. You increase the entropy of the universe by letting the black hole evaporate. Um, so everything is okay, you know, it, it all fits together. To get this, to get all, the, I mean, this is just very beautiful. And why did I save this for the Q&A video? Um, you know, I had this rule for the actual videos, the biggest ideas in the universe, that we're talking about ideas that we have very, very good reason to believe are true. <laughs> I'm not getting into all different sorts of speculation because then, you know, I have my favorite kinds of speculation, other people have their own kinds of speculation. So we're not talking in these videos a lot about the multiverse or inflation or, you know, your particular grand unified theory or dark matter or any of these things. I mean, dark matter exists, but which one, which candidate it is, we don't know. So I don't want to get into all the different candidates and things like that. Hawking radiation is in this funny in-between um, space. Almost no one doubts that it is real because it's much like the graviton. It's not quite as, as uh, well established as the graviton, but gravitons, were, we haven't observed directly individual gravitons, and we may never because they so weakly interact. But they're absolutely consequences of the very basic features of quantum mechanics and general relativity. So it's very hard to imagine wriggling out of the implication that gravitons are real. The, the metric in general relativity is a field. It has fluctuations. It has to be quantized. There should be gravitons. That's basically it. We detected the classical gravitational waves. It would be very weird if there were not a particle-like excitation that we could observe in principle called the graviton. 
So Hawking radiation, which gives rise to this temperature and this evaporation and this entropy, um, is similar to that. It's not quite as well established because, you know, black holes are not quite as well established as flat space through which a graviton could travel. But it seems to be an almost inescapable conclusion that black holes should give off Hawking radiation. So I want to get it mentioned, but we haven't observed it. We might never observe it. We might, we might not. Uh, but until we do, you know, the rules of science say it's still speculative, okay? Uh, even if everyone believes it, it still counts as a speculation. Now, like I said, uh, Hawking got this fact about temperature by considering quantum mechanics. And here, you know, I, I need to be a little bit careful about how to talk about this. Here's how, here's one way of talking about it. Remember I drew the picture of the black hole as a cylinder. So if I use sort of conventional coordinates, here's the event horizon of a black hole, the radial coordinate R, and this is time going up like that and out here the light cones look like this but on the event horizon they look like this and inside they look like this so they're pointing towards r equals zero which is the singularity that's the singularity there and what hawking said is what i should do is think about quantum field theory and what I should actually do is think about virtual particles. So let, let, let me back up because the reason why I'm hesitating to talk about this is because of course, there's what Hawking did, which was a very careful calculation in the context of quantum field theory. And then there's what Hawking said he did when he explained it to people who didn't read the original calculation, right? So if you read A Brief History of Time, what Hawking says is, well, you know, in empty space, there are these quantum fluctuations. There are virtual particles popping in and out of existence. So you could imagine, now let's use a different color for our virtual uh, particle fluctuations. Uh, you can imagine, you know, an electron and a positron popping in and out of existence in empty space. And this is just sort of part of the renormalization of the vacuum. We already talked about this. There are Feynman diagrams that just represent what happens in empty space all by itself. And the vocabulary Hawking used is that sometimes near the event horizon, you'll get these particle-antiparticle pairs where one of them will cross the horizon and the other one will not. And in that case, the one that crosses the horizon will fall in, and the one that escapes will escape to infinity, and you'll observe it. And that's the Hawking radiation. It doesn't have to be electrons and positrons. In fact, since the temperature is so low, what you want is very, very, very low energy particles, and it's much easier to have that be photons or gravitons themselves. So it's almost always photons that come out of the black holes. Um, and how it works, this is another tricky thing about general relativity. Read my much longer technical book if you want the details. But the energy of the ingoing particle turns out from the point of view of an observer very, very far away, this has an energy less than zero. So the particle that comes out has an energy greater than zero. So the reason why the hole is shrinking is because it is absorbing negative energy, negative mass particles. That's why its mass is going down. Now, this is kind of hokey, this whole explanation, because it really is set in a language that takes a little bit too literally the dynamical fluctuation of virtual particles in empty space. As we tried to explain in previous videos, in the Big Idea video about interactions and Feynman diagrams, Feynman diagrams are a story. Um, if the black hole weren't there, you could tell this story of virtual particles popping in and out of existence, but the quantum state of the vacuum is actually perfectly stationary. Nothing is changing over time. Nothing is literally popping in and out of existence. The real reason why these particles go away has to do with the fact that once you're in the presence of a black hole, you're not in the vacuum. There's a horizon there. Uh, you, there's no reason for the state to be static. And indeed, the state, the state is not static. The black hole evaporates, right? You're not in a vacuum state. So, you know, there's different justifications you can attach to this fact, but the equations back you up, okay? In fact, there's, by now, by even by the 80s, there were multiple different ways of deriving the fact that black holes have a temperature and do radiate away. I just want to, you know, if you heard what we said before about Feynman diagrams just being a story, and you also heard Hawking's version of this story, I just want them you to be able to rec reconcile those in your head. Hawking's story is also just a story. His equations were something very different and a little bit more reliable and more difficult to argue with. 
Okay, final part of this whole story um, is the information loss puzzle, the info loss puzzle. So the idea here is that in quantum mechanics, we have the Schrodinger equation, right? H psi equals I H bar D by DT psi, okay? The time rate of change of the quantum state is proportional to the Hamiltonian acting on the quantum state. And this is the Schrodinger equation and it's perfectly deterministic. We'll talk more later about determinism more generally, but this is deterministic. You give me a state, you give me the Hamiltonian, I evolve it forward in time, okay? There's no puzzle about what the state will be. Now, of course, we know that in the real world, um, the noticeable, observable, phenomenological evolution of the wave function is not deterministic. Wave functions appear to collapse. So that's because of a measurement, and to an Everetti and to a many worlds person, they say, well, that's only because the wave function is branched and you don't see the whole thing anymore. The whole thing is still deterministic. You just find yourself on a single branch. To other people, they will tell other stories about it, okay? But the fact of quantum measurement is one reason why the wave function does not appear to evolve deterministically. But you still can say otherwise, except for measuring, the wave function should evolve deterministically, okay? Well, that's not true for Hawking radiation. For Hawking radiation, you have a black hole, okay? And it gives off radiation. And what Hawking derived in his formulas is that you cannot deterministically evolve from the black hole to the entirely evaporated black hole. So here is poof, black hole went away, okay? This rule, Hawking's rule, to go from a black hole to a gas of radiation, a bunch of photons leaving the black hole, having evaporated completely away, is not deterministic. There is some randomness that sneaks in there so you can make the black hole. Let's say you made the black hole out of collapsing not a star, but a whole bunch of books. Don't ask me why you would ever want to do such a terrible thing, but let's imagine that you have a whole bunch of books and you've thrown them into the black hole. Books. You made a black hole out of books. This is deterministic. This is the Schrodinger equation. But once the Hawking ev evaporation happens, it is no longer deterministic. So it seems that if there were writing in the books, there is information in the books, that information has been destroyed by the black hole evaporating. You cannot recover it, even in principle. And you might say, well, I destroy information all the time. I take you know, a book and I burn it or something like that. Let's, let's imagine you don't burn books on purpose, but by accident, maybe there's a fire and the book burned, okay? I've lost the information. But according to the Schrodinger equation, as long as no quantum wave function collapse has happened, in principle, even though it would be very hard to actually recover it, the information contained in the book that you burned is still there. It's contained in very, very subtle correlations and locations of all the photons and all the heat and light that came out and the ash and dust that came out of the burning, okay? Whereas here, it seems that the information is once and truly lost in a more fundamental way. I'm not gonna say much more about the black hole information puzzle than that. It's a good puzzle. Um, the reason why it's hard is because you, know, you might just say, well, okay, Hawking's, Hawking's derivation was just incomplete. You know, he didn't know the once and for all rules of quantum gravity. And that's completely fair. He didn't. It was kind of a phenomenological thing. It's like the difference between you know, fluid mechanics and the individual microscopic notions of the individual atoms. Hawking was working at the level of this higher level theory. He didn't claim to have a full theory of quantum gravity. He was just doing quantum field theory in a curved background space time. So maybe you can say, once we got this all figured out, then we can see how the information gets out. That's a perfectly valid ambition to have and to hope for. It turns out to be really, really hard to get there in practice. And the basic reason why is it goes back up to these diagrams that we're drawing, right? Of, you know, here we made a black hole out of a collapsing star. So let's make a black hole and let it evaporate, okay? So instead of a diagram that looks like this with the uh, singularity here, horizon here, star collapsing here, okay, so here is R and T. As what we made before, here is the horizon. 
I should just draw the horizon in a different color, shouldn't I? So, so it's visible, okay. And that's the singularity. Make the singularity a different color also. So here, information loss is no big puzzle. I mean, you take a book and you throw it into the black hole, book, throw it in. Well, I mean, it's lost to you. The information that was in the book is inside the black hole now, but you can convince yourself it's not lost to the universe. It's just inside the black hole. I can't get there, but it still exists, okay? This is what makes Hawking's story puzzling is because the black hole goes away. So you can no longer say that the information in the book is in the black hole. And the kinds of diagrams that we draw in this case, I'll make things simple by not drawing the star collapsing anymore. Um, here is the event horizon. You know, at some point the event horizon forms, right? But then it goes away because there's Hawking radiation that escapes to infinity, the black hole shrinks, and the way people draw the diagram is the singularity sort of ends at some point here, and then the uh, event horizon also ends there, and therefore this becomes the new origin of coordinates. So this is r equals zero here, and this is r equals zero here. It got shifted over to the right, but that's just a way of drawing. And the black hole is just this area right here. It sort of came into existence for a finite time. It evaporated away, okay? Fine, all well and good. Information is getting out like that. But the problem is now if I throw the book, let me draw the book in a different color. Sorry about all the different colors. So here's a book. I'm not gonna draw all the pages anymore. But I throw the book in here. And remember we said once you cross the event horizon, nothing crazy happens. Right? You're just in the black hole. So you can go all the way to the singularity and then be smushed in the singularity. Okay. If nothing crazy happens when you cross the event horizon, the book doesn't get erased, or the information in the book doesn't get transferred to the Hawking radiation. The book doesn't even notice. The book just goes right through the event horizon okay? until it smashes through the singularity. And we mentioned, you know, I don't say all these things just for my health, we mentioned that the singularity is a space-like surface. So if the information in the black hole can get to the singularity without being copied, there's a theorem, by the way, in quantum mechanics that you cannot copy quantum mechanical information with perfect fidelity. So it can't be copied. The information in the, in the book is not somehow photocopied onto the Hawking radiation. That's not what happens. The information cannot get from this point where the book hits the singularity to the outside world without moving faster than the speed of light. There is no space for it to travel in because the singularity is the end of the universe. So if you want to come up with some more complicated, more sophisticated, uh, fuller and, and more rigorously true laws of nature that are including quantum mechanics and gravity and explain why the information gets out of the black hole, then good for you. Let's try to do that. But it seems from the picture that it will require superluminal trans transfer translation, transmission, superluminal transmission of that information. It will have to leave the black hole faster than the speed of light. Or somehow there's non-locality. There is some kind of new spooky action at a distance. Remember, Isaac Newton had his spooky action at a distance because he had two planets that were gravitationally pulling on each other. And then we said, well, there's really a gravitational field in between, so we can explain that. Einstein had his spooky action at a distance where two entangled particles could be observed very far away and the uh, measurement outcome of one would affect the other, but we realized that no information can be transmitted this way. It seems here that information has to travel faster than the speed of light to get outside the black hole if information is truly going to be preserved. Now, one of the leading ideas right now is that that's kind of what happens, <laughs> you know? At some point, you bite the bullet. That really secretly, there's a microscopic wormhole connecting what's going on inside the horizon to what's going on outside, and somehow that doesn't lead to like large aliens traveling from inside the black hole to us, but it affects the character of the Hawking radiation coming out. Is this true? Who knows? We don't know. But this is a very exciting, like, honestly, since the 1990s, 
some of the brightest theoretical physicists in the world have been trying to figure out how to get the information out of an evaporating black hole. We still don't know for sure, but a lot of good work has been done uh, inspired by this. You know, that's what we have. I, you know, when, I, when Hawking passed away a short while ago, um, I was asked to write a piece for the New York Times, you know, an, not an obituary or a biography, but an appreciation. Like, what did he do? What is Hawking's greatest gift to us? And Hawking, as a scientist, and Hawking did a lot of cool things, right? Um, Hawking, uh, you know, the area theorem, right? Um, Hawking radiation, Hawking entropy. But in some sense, the black hole information problem, puzzle, some people call it a paradox, but it's not a paradox, it's a puzzle. Um, that's his greatest gift, because that's a puzzle. You know, we don't have a lot of experimental puzzles in quantum gravity. So a thought experiment puzzle to think about and improve our knowledge of what might be going on to act as a guide to the once and for all theory of quantum gravity, that's one of the greatest things you can give to the scientific community. And, uh, and that's what Hawking did. That's why he was kind of a big deal.